So much has been said about Shenmue over the years. So many retrospectives and documentaries about its origins and its inspiration, its extravagant production values and technical aspects. I'm not going to make a video along these lines. It's been done many times before and it's been done extremely well. Instead, I'm going to offer a rambling, idiosyncratic, personal take on Shenmue and what I think makes it truly special. What it meant to me as a young man and what it still means to me as an old young man. In the mid to late 90s, Sega did not do a good job of advertising its consoles or its games. As a child, I was a total Sega head, in fact I still am. My mom had bought me a Mega Drive for my birthday in 1992 and I was giddy with excitement. I'd seen the original Sonic the Hedgehog whizzing around on the corner-mounted CRT of my local computer game shop. I was entranced by the speed, colour and sheer irresistible positivity. And to top it all off, it had a comprehensible human voice saying, Sega! As a child whose only real exposure to games to that point had been my big brother's Amstrad CPC 464, what a beast that was. I was stunned. In the mid-90s, after briefly owning and then selling a Sony PlayStation, I bought a Sega Saturn for Christmas 96. Stop sniggering at the back, please. It's the greatest console ever made. It came with Christmas nights into Dreams, Sega Rally, and Virtual Fighter 2. My brother then bought me my own copy of Fighting Vipers as an additional Christmas gift. What a year that was. Later on, I picked up some amazing titles like Panzer Dragoon Zwei and Saga, Terror Diver, Last Bronx, Shining the Holy Ark, and Grandia. In fact, push comes to shove, the Sega Saturn is my favourite games console of all time. Into the Dreamcast era. I bought issue zero of Sega Dreamcast magazine in 1999 while out with my dad in Manchester City Centre one afternoon. It included a VHS tape containing a trailer sizzle reel for the upcoming console and its games, narrated by none other than punk Svengali and uber weirdo Malcolm McLaren. Very hip indeed. I popped the tape into our VHS player and started to get excited. Dreamcast is the most powerful games console in the world's history, by far. And it's the first games console that will bring you into the world of online gaming, emailing, and worldwide web surfing. Dreamcast will take you beyond your expectations. Its unrivaled 128-bit technology leaps ahead of current systems in terms of graphics, speed, and pure, unadulterated gameplay. Dreamcast Awesome Speed can deliver over 4 million polygons a second, making it look better and play better than anything your TV has ever seen. Fluid animation, lighting effects, 3D environments and textures appear more lifelike than ever thought possible. In-game audio reaches new heights with a staggering 64 channels of music, voices and sound effects. With technology like this, Dreamcast will redefine the way you play. It was clear that Sega was going for a chic, streamlined lifestyle product that was also extremely powerful for its day. It made games on the PS1 and even the N64 look shit in comparison. I then bought the official Dreamcast magazine almost every month and used to browse the early IGN website for games news and reviews etc. But I didn't really catch wind of Shenmue until a November issue of DC UK in November 2000. That's just one month before the game's release. The official Dreamcast magazine had offered only a short preview of the game way back in issue 1, and had then neglected to mention it at all until issue 13, when they offered a two-page preview, followed by a review in the following issue. For a monolithic $70 million adventure game developed by the God of Arcade Games, Yu Suzuki, it never ceases to amaze me how little Sega pushed the title. I mean, there should have been hyperbole, advertisements, and TV commercials everywhere. Instead, the average consumer, in the UK at least, had almost zero awareness of this game at launch. It was almost as if it had been set up to fail. Perhaps after footing its enormous development bill, Sega didn't actually have any money left to promote the thing. 
who knows? In a strange, paradoxical way, the fact that this lavish, naive, exotic game even got made in the first place displays just how lopsided and disorganized Sega had become in the late 90s. So, issue 14 of the official Dreamcast magazine, this is the one I remember most clearly, it contained a 7 page review of the game, a 10 out of 10 score, of course, and it also included this trailer. try to make use of both mirrors. What will he try? That even I don't know. Considering the legend associated with this mirror, undoubtedly there's a connection. I'm begging you, please take it over. My mind is made up. I must go. I will have my revenge. Let me invite you to hell. Hey, boy! Ah. Ain't no escape, boy! Perhaps find that mirror, and then we'll talk. There must be some information here. This area has been getting rather dangerous recently. Would you like something to eat? I'll give it a try. First, I'll teach you the steps. Step forward, step again. Then get. Okay. Unbelievable, man! Hey, stop! Damn! Ah, later, sorry! Please, just for a while, stay with me. I wish time would just stand still. Don't you dare touch her! Instantaneous judgments will affect your fate. So you know about Landy. Just who the hell is he? Every experience will differ from another. I'll only tell you if you prove stronger than me. Vast area, enormous number of characters. If Landy gets that mirror, no one can stop him. Is this a game? Father! Keep friends. Those you love. No! An emergence of a true, fully interactive game. Step into another reality. Shenmue. Now I was starting to get excited. The incredibly realistic and detailed graphics, the sweeping Asian-flavored orchestral music, 
epic scope and cinematic presentation just bowled me over. I was a huge fan of the Virtua Fighter games, and when I realised that Shenmue shared a lot of the same DNA, I was convinced I had to have it. But how? I had no job, no money, and as a boy, I was quite phenomenally lazy. Christmas to the rescue once more. Oh, hello there! It was Christmas 2000, and I'd just turned sweet 16. Perhaps like a lot of boys my age, I was rather wayward and withdrawn at this stage in my life. In fact, to be completely honest, I was barely on planet Earth whatsoever. I'd recently finished my GCSEs at a local comprehensive school, and I'd just started my A-levels at a thoroughly middle-class sixth-form college. I was alienated from most of the private school kids I'd begun to mix with, alienated from the adult world at large, and most crucially, alienated from myself. I attended classes very sporadically indeed, and spent most of my time eating toast and smoking weed at home when my parents had gone out to work. At night, I used to hang around with my misfit friends, taking ecstasy, smoking more weed, eating mushrooms, and listening to bands like Queens of the Stone Age, Pixies, Radiohead, Super Furry Animals, The Beatles, etc, etc. I've been a good, honest, God-fearing kid, but at this particular time, I was alienated, raw, and completely directionless. I stole Shenmue from my parents' bedroom ahead of Christmas Day, popped it into my Dreamcast, and was completely captivated. I remember playing it with a friend in my bedroom during that first playthrough in December 2000. The stunned silence as we ate peanut butter on toast, puffed on a crudely rolled joint, and stared glassy-eyed in sheer wonderment at this incredibly detailed, living, breathing world wallowing in its zen-like ambience. Shenmue was fucking amazing. Today I live with my wife and daughter in Manchester, but I spent my youth in an unremarkable, perpetually overcast, relatively affluent semi-rural town in the county of Cheshire in the northwest of England. In terms of its size, its population, its muted tones, and slate grey skies, it was not unlike Dabuita in many ways. And I'm confident there are lots of Shenmue fans out there who also come from unremarkable small towns like mine. Now to me, this is an important aspect of Dio's relatability as a protagonist, and of the Shenmue saga as a whole. Dio doesn't come from outer space, or some grand fantasy kingdom, or even from some dark, shadowy netherworld. He comes from an every place, a completely unremarkable Japanese town. A truly liminal space. And people from other small, unremarkable, slightly shit towns, be it from France, the UK, the US, or indeed Japan, could all relate to these humble beginnings. Despite its fascinating, distinctly Japanese texture, if you just cocked your head to the side and squint a little bit, Dabuita could almost be your hometown. This combination of the strangely familiar and the exotic is surely one reason why it resonated so deeply with a relatively small but dedicated Western audience. The fact that Shenmue resonated with me so powerfully is not explained purely by some wistful nostalgia for my teenage years, but I'll admit that it's probably impossible to form a bond with an album, a book, a film, or indeed a computer game in quite the same way outside of those tender, magical, and are quite often terrifying teenage years. Learning to cope in a precarious, unscrupulous adult world by losing touch with the magic and innocence of childhood is a frankly shit experience for some people. The world to me as a 16 year old was a cold, baffling, and deeply cynical place. At the zenith of this haunting, disorientating journey through adolescence, Dio's tragic and mysterious plight, his courage, and stoic determination to do what's right, the warm-hearted people he meets along the way, and the irresistible, romantic fatalism that pervades the series as a whole, served as verification that there was still some tenderness, courage, and fidelity left in this world. It's a tale of tragedy, morality, self-actualization, and of course, confused, elderly, pissed-up Father Christmas impersonators. 
To my mind, there are two key aspects to the appeal of Shemu. Now one's the story, and the other one is the world building. There's been lots of talk about Shemu being the original open world game. That's true in a certain sense, but the world of Shemu has always been a smaller, richer, more intimate world than other admittedly far more spectacular open world games. The scope of Shemu's world, in the year 2000 at least, was indeed quite amazing. There's a whole town centre, a couple of villages, and a large harbour area. But it's the minutiae of the world that sets it apart from its open world cousins. Dabuita is like a beautiful, handcrafted terrarium. The people of Dabuita all have unique faces, distinctive gaits, and character traits. They've got their own unique day jobs, and their individual daily routines. The attention to micro-environmental detail is still stunning to this day. The weather system is modelled on real-life weather forecasts from Yokosuka, Japan in 1986, ranging from snow to rain to sunshine to overcast and almost everywhere in between. See how the inhabitants pop open their umbrellas when it starts to rain. See how Dio's feet and knees adjust in real time to uneven surfaces such as stairs or curbs, or how the sound of Dio's footsteps changes depending on the road surface, be it tarmac, gravel, or snow. See how the pigeons in the harbour scatter as Dio approaches, then reassemble as a flock a few yards away. Now is this kind of detail necessary? No, of course not. Is it wasteful, in some sense? Most probably, yeah. Does it help to suspend disbelief and to create an impression of a living, breathing, tangible world? Absolutely. Even in modern AAA games with spectacular ray traced 4K graphics, my suspension of disbelief is often broken when I witness my character's legs scuttling around beneath them, bearing little, if any, relation to the terrain. Almost like a metal chess piece, skating around on a board controlled by some concealed magnet. Now it's true that, as a result of this relatively realistic style of walking, Dio is somewhat awkward and tank-like to control. But he also walks with a distinct weight, momentum, and physicality. You always feel that you're part of this world, not merely a floating camera gliding across its surface. Within minutes of starting Cyberpunk 2077, I saw a multitude of duplicate and palette-swapped NPCs wandering its empty streets. Cyberpunk's world is truly vast, but in a strange way, it feels oddly small, with row upon row upon row of non-interactive, faceless office blocks, duplicate vehicles, and NPCs. Despite the enormous scale, it somehow fails to give the impression of an organic, populated world, and ends up feeling strangely empty and lifeless. Sometimes, most of the time in fact, less is indeed more. Shemu gives such a strong impression of a living, breathing world going on beyond the visible limits of the game world, that it leaves many of these vast, immaculately rendered open world games feeling hollow in comparison. The second key aspect of Shemu is its story. I came for the lavish, simulated reality, but I stayed for the strong, linear storyline. Due to the nature of their faux, non-linear story structures, AAA open world games often fail to communicate a truly cohesive, focused narrative, and to my mind, the best attempts have been GTA 4, the original Red Dead, and possibly Horizon. All excellent games, with vast, incredible worlds to explore, and featuring somewhat memorable characters. But despite all this, the stories are muddied and discombobulated by the unnecessarily huge number of side quests and see the player frequently lose their grip on the characters and on the central thread. The triple perspective storyline of GTA V, for example, was an absolute clusterfuck from a storytelling perspective, a major step down from the much more focused and compact story of Nico Bellic from GTA IV. Speaking of genre, Shemu in fact has more in common with world-building, cinematic visual novels like Hideo Kojima's Snatcher, more recent cult hits like Deadly Premonition, or even walking simulators such as Dear Esther or Firewatch than it does with most modern AAA open-world games. 
There's even a touch of Harvest Moon or Animal Crossing about this richly detailed micro-environment filled with unique idiosyncratic NPCs with unique character traits and daily routines. Take Yakuza for example. Now I really do like the Yakuza games and I'm happy that Sega's still making cool titles like this in-house, albeit not many of them. But after numerous attempts at getting into the series, the storylines have failed to grip me in any meaningful way, and my attention has always drifted onto other things. The girls, the glam, the hedonistic violence is certainly fun for a while, but it somehow ends up feeling a little superficial. There's something so personal, intimate, and vulnerable about Dio's quest for vengeance that never fails to engage me. Despite all the ridiculous English voiceovers, the references to sailors, faultlift truck races, and tomato convenience store jingles, there's a profound streak of melancholy running through Shenmue, particularly this first game, and in fact the atmosphere at times is actually quite eerie and unsettling. Just listen to these instrumental tracks that play as Dio makes his way around town, and tell me there isn't a sprinkle of ontological queasiness in there somewhere. On the flip side, this often desolate and uncanny atmosphere is contrasted by yearning flights of fancy like this. The fundamental sadness and profound sense of loss and longing in the original Shenmue seems to escape many people. It is for me at least one of the defining features of this original game, and one of the many things that sets it apart from really all of the game series actually. It's the kind of atypical tone usually reserved for obscure indie games, not 70 million dollar behemoths from the makers of Outrun, Virtual Fighter, and Daytona USA. It also distinguishes this game to some extent from its Sundrenched sequel, and from its estranged cousin, the Yakuza series, which despite numerous paradoxically superficial similarities in terms of structure and gameplay, is light years away from Shenmue in terms of tone, atmosphere, and story. Shenmue begins with a tragedy. A young man loses his father at a tender age, and we later learn that his mum passed away some time ago. Dio is alone in this world a drab, sleepy, and sparsely populated world. A world of damp, stained concrete, rain, snow, and overcast skies. There are numerous references to orphans throughout the first two games. From the kitten, just down the road from Dio's home, to the children in the Kowloon Orphanage in Shenmue 2. And Li Xiaotao also reveals to Dio that she has been orphaned at a young age. There are a lot of sad stories in the world of Shenmue. In contrast to this sweeping melancholy, there's also an irresistible drive, ambition, and a promise bubbling away in the heart of this game. Dio refuses to be beaten in spite of insurmountable odds. Dio is a stoic character, steeped in the samurai ethics his father has instilled in him from a young age. Dear Ryo, those who follow the path of a warrior must be ready to die. 
in order to stand by their convictions. Live for one's convictions. Die for one's convictions. That is how I lived my life. Ryo, it is up to you to discover your path and follow it through. My father must have known that Lan Li was coming. Here's a quote from the Hakaguri, the Book of the Samurai, which I think encapsulates Dio's response to his father's death in the opening sequence, and what drives him onward through the three games. Even if it seems certain that you will lose, retaliate. Neither wisdom nor technique has a place in this. A real man does not think of victory or defeat. He plunges recklessly towards an irrational death. By doing this, you will awaken from your dreams. Dio is told repeatedly by the characters he meets along the way that his task is hopeless, that Landy is far too strong, that he shouldn't throw his life away for the sake of revenge. But Dio won't listen. Dio is a good samurai boy, and he will stop at nothing to do what he feels is right, even if he dies in the process. Shemu is a highly personal and moral tale, one that echoes the great works of samurai fiction, albeit in an often pulpy, kung fu movie-esque manner. Dio's samurai ethic echoes the ambitions of its creators. Shemu was a labor of love and of blind faith. We'll make a product so filled with love and attention to detail, such groundbreaking technical prowess and quality, that somehow it will succeed, in spite of the plainly obvious fact that this was always a highly idiosyncratic and esoteric concept that was highly unlikely to find genuine mass market appeal, especially on a console produced by a cash-strapped somewhat diminished company like Sega. After the dreadful mess of the late Mega Drive period, when they were supporting a ludicrous number of consoles simultaneously, through to the commercial failure of the Sega Saturn, Sega decided to throw in all its remaining chips with the Dreamcast and with Shenmue. They hoped to make a preemptive strike on Sony's PS2, and they hoped to win big. Like an ill-fated samurai leaping into certain death, they ran in headlong, shouting and screaming, they fought bravely, and they fell. But there is honor in this. They at least dared to be great. And in the process, they left behind a trail of truly mesmerizing, beloved computer games. And for that, I love and admire them. I think it's fair to say that Shenmue was too ambitious for its own good. It was flawed, ill-advised, and it was naive but I wouldn't have it any other way. To my mind, Shenmue stands together with Panzer Dragoon Saga as a high watermark of Sega's craftsmanship, artistic integrity, and creative nous. I'd put only the likes of Legend of Zelda, the works of Team Eco, and Silent Hill 2 on the same tier. These men and women set out to make the most dazzling work of art they could muster, with little regard for market trends and financial bottom lines. Just make the best thing you can possibly make, and the people will come. And people did indeed come. But unfortunately, the will be in the way it is. They didn't come in great enough numbers to justify the enormous budgets and their dying platforms. You can either see Shenmue as a grand folly, or, if you're like me, you could see it as a glimpse of how things could be if the world happened to be a nicer place. You may say I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. There's nothing else quite like Shemu, and there won't be anything else quite like it again, except for more Shemu, hopefully. When all is said and done, I love the game for its scope, its courage, its ambition, its sweet melancholy, and for the sheer aching romance of it. May the impossible dream live on.